Have you ever wondered what really happens on a battlefield once the last cries of combat fade into silence? A soldier lies wounded on the ground. His body, bloodied and broken, sinks into the cold mud. Around him, the bodies of fallen comrades blend with the encroaching earth, as nature begins its quiet reclaiming what once was. Suddenly, another soldier approaches. It becomes clear they're not there to help. Their faces set with grim determination. He kneels, stripping away the fallen man's armor, once a proud emblem of his courage, leaving him exposed to the chilling air and the indifferent gazes of those who pass by. This grim reality begs the question, what truly happened after the dust settled? Claiming victory on the battlefield is only the beginning of a complex and demanding process. While the thrill of triumph often draws soldiers to storm the enemy's camp, the aftermath of a battle involves far more than just seizing a win. The immediate priority for Roman soldiers, despite the chaos surrounding them, was not the fallen comrades, but the valuable resources left behind. Every piece of equipment, every scrap of food they could scavenge was vital. Exhausted, yet fueled by instinct and the promise of reward, they began the crucial task of searching the battlefield for loot. This practice was not merely about personal gain. It was an essential part of maintaining their strength and resourcing their campaigns for future conflicts. The collection of spoils was a crucial post-battle activity that underscored the Roman military's organizational structure and the importance of discipline and fairness among the ranks. This process was overseen by the general staff, who were responsible for ensuring that all battlefield loot was collected and distributed according to established regulations. In this intricate system, all spoils officially belonged to the general, who served as the representative of the state. This practice was vital in reinforcing the notion that military success was not about individual glory, but rather a testament to the might and prestige of Rome itself. Consequently, soldiers were required to surrender everything they found on the battlefield, including weapons, armor, gold, silver, and other valuables. These items were processed and assessed by the general staff to ensure an equitable distribution that rewarded soldiers based on their rank and contributions. The spoils were typically distributed fairly, ensuring that each soldier was compensated for their efforts. The Romans believed that equitable distribution of rewards helped maintain morale and loyalty within the ranks. The process involved meticulous record-keeping, as officers documented the items collected, and the amount of cash to be paid to each soldier based on their rank and contributions during the campaign. Key regulations governed this process. Soldiers had to surrender all loot, which was then meticulously catalogued and assessed. The distribution was equitable, with higher-ranking officers receiving a larger share. It was about maintaining order among the ranks. Each soldier had a stake in the outcome, and it was vital for morale that rewards were shared equitably. Officers maintained detailed records of collected items and their distribution to prevent disputes and ensure accountability. Importantly, soldiers were prohibited from keeping any spoils for personal gain, reinforcing the principle that all loot belonged to the state. Records from various campaigns indicate that soldiers received substantial compensation for their roles in battle. For instance, during the campaigns of the late Republic, the sums paid to soldiers could be significant. A soldier's salary could range from 900 to 1,200 denarii per year, with additional bonuses sometimes being awarded for participation in successful campaigns. To put this into perspective, using a rough estimate that one denarius equated to approximately $20 today, a soldier's salary would be around $18,000 to $24,000 in modern dollars. For example, after the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE, Augustus granted 1,200 denarii to each veteran as a bonus for their service, which was a substantial amount at the time. In comparison, a skilled worker or artisan might earn around 300 to 600 denarii a year, highlighting the significant financial incentive for soldiers. These monetary rewards were not just a means of compensation, but also served as a way to reinforce loyalty to the general and the state. Soldiers would often feel a sense of duty to serve well, knowing that their efforts could lead to tangible rewards, both in terms of loot collected and bonuses paid after a successful campaign. The real treasures, gold, jewels, and other high-value items, were heavily guarded by special teams within the Roman military. These treasures not only held significant monetary value, 
but also symbolic importance, representing the military's successes and the glory of Rome. Following a successful campaign, these valuables were often paraded during triumph ceremonies in Rome, a grand spectacle that celebrated military victories and showcased the spoils of war to the citizens. During these ceremonies, the general, adorned in a laurel crown and a purple toga, would lead a procession through the streets of Rome, displaying the captured wealth. This public display served to reinforce the connection between military achievements and civic pride, emphasizing that the spoils belong to the state rather than individual soldiers. Additionally, many of these treasures were dedicated to the gods or the state, as a gesture of gratitude for their favor and support in battle. This act of devotion underscored the Roman belief that military success was not merely a matter of personal achievement, but a shared triumph that contributed to the greatness of the Roman Empire. However, this didn't prevent soldiers and camp followers from trying to pocket valuable items on the side. When no officers were around, soldiers would loot enemy corpses or tents, taking small items like footwear, cloaks, weapons, jewelry, or even everyday objects like cups. These were prized for being easily portable and saleable. Occasionally, soldiers lucked into luxury items such as richly decorated saddles or furniture from enemy officers' tents, items worth months of a soldier's salary. The challenge was sneaking these treasures back to camp without being caught and punished. The frustrations of Roman soldiers after their victory at Sinocephaly were palpable, as they arrived to find that the Aetolians had already looted the enemy camp. This preemptive pillaging led to tensions within the ranks with Roman soldiers feeling deprived of their rightful share of spoils. Such scenarios were not uncommon. Loot distribution could often cause internal strife. If soldiers were given free reign to loot, the first to break rank would claim the best items, leaving those on patrol, tending to the wounded, or burying the dead with the least valuable pickings. This imbalance sometimes triggered fights and fostered resentment among the troops. In addition to valuable items, the recovery of usable gear was critical. Soldiers meticulously scoured the battlefield for broken equipment that could be repaired and reused. They collected enemy weapons and armor as trophies or repurposed them for emergencies when supplies ran low. The Romans were nothing if not pragmatic, nothing usable was wasted. Livy recounts that after the disastrous Battle of Cannae, Rome reclaimed weapons that had been displayed as trophies in temples to re-equip their legions. This practice ensured that even in the aftermath of severe losses, Roman armies could be swiftly rearmed and ready for future engagements. Battlefields were typically stripped clean within days, leaving behind only damaged or difficult to find items like arrowheads, artillery missiles, and sling bullets. These remnants have become some of the most common artifacts discovered during modern excavations, as complete weapons or armor were simply too valuable to be abandoned. Additionally, trophy hunters roamed the battlefield, collecting banners, weapons, and armor. These items often found their way into temples or were used as decorations in the homes of Roman patricians. Livestock also became part of the spoils. Human spoils, prisoners of war, were particularly sought after as they could be sold as slaves. This practice was especially prevalent with barbarian captives, whose sale generated prize money for the soldiers. In a twisted sense, looting becomes a means of reclaiming agency transforming the battlefield's despair into a resource for the living. In the meantime, groups of idle soldiers are quickly dispatched to search for wounded comrades scattered across the battlefield. For some, every minute is crucial. The difference between life and death hangs in the balance, and they must be located amid the countless bodies. Each wounded soldier who can be saved is invaluable. Each recovery means less time and resources spent on recruitment and training. Moreover, Retaining experienced soldiers bolsters the army's overall capability, ensuring that the legion remains strong and effective. Soldiers who are able to walk or have only minor injuries receive immediate treatment from the army's medical staff right on the battlefield. Those requiring further assistance are loaded onto stretchers or wagons and transported to field hospitals, where the Medici, army doctors, do their best under the constraints of ancient medical practices. However, Medical care at the time often depended more on luck than on advanced medical science, as resources and knowledge were limited. For those suffering from fatal injuries or showing signs of infection, care is administered, albeit with significant limitations. Roman discipline extended not only to the care of their own, but occasionally even to their enemies. 
Those fortunate enough to survive the slaughter were transported back to hastily erected camps, where makeshift hospitals, known as Valetudinaria, were established to tend to the wounded. The Valetudinaria were often simple yet functional structures, quickly assembled using available materials. These facilities typically featured wooden frames that stood around 10 to 15 feet high, allowing for adequate ventilation and light. The width varied based on the number of patients, often spanning about 20 to 30 feet, and could be extended as needed. The walls were made from canvas or animal hides stretched tightly over the wooden framework, providing shelter from the elements and creating a semi-enclosed space where the wounded could receive care. Inside, the atmosphere was filled with the sharp medicinal scent of antiseptics and herbs like myrrh and sage, known for their healing properties. These scents mingled with the metallic aroma of blood, creating a distinct and somber environment. Healers and surgeons worked tirelessly amidst the chaos, navigating through the bustle of medical staff tending to the wounded. Along the sides of the Valetudinaria were sturdy wooden benches, approximately six feet long and two feet wide constructed from planks that provided a rough but functional surface for the wounded. Makeshift beds lined with straw or woolen blankets were set up for those who required more extensive care, ensuring that patients had a semblance of comfort as they recovered. Physicians, often experienced veterans or specially trained medics, moved swiftly between various sections of the Valetudinaria, employing a range of treatments tailored to the needs of the wounded. They used surgical tools crafted from metal or sharpened stone, including scalpels and forceps, which were essential for performing medical procedures. The Romans had developed an impressive understanding of battlefield medicine, emphasizing rapid treatment to stabilize soldiers for a swift return to combat. First, pain management was addressed. Although the Romans lacked modern anesthetics, they often used mixtures of wine and herbs to dull the pain. In some cases, Soldiers were given strong herbal concoctions to help them relax before the surgery, creating a more manageable experience during the procedure. Next, the surgeon would meticulously clean the wound, removing any foreign objects or dead tissue to reduce the risk of infection. This step was crucial, as battlefield wounds were often contaminated with dirt and debris. After the wound was thoroughly cleaned, physicians would apply dressings to protect it. If the injury was severe, the physician might need to perform amputations or other urgent surgical interventions to save the soldier's life. Finally, once the wound was cleaned, the physician would close it with sutures made from animal sinew or linen thread. These sutures were tied securely, but not too tightly, to allow for swelling and ensure proper blood circulation. Their emphasis on speed and effectiveness helped ensure that soldiers could return to combat as quickly as possible reflecting the broader military ethos of the Roman army. The process of locating and treating the wounded can extend over several days, as medical teams work diligently to assess and attend to each soldier's needs. The recovery period can be long and arduous, taking weeks or even months, before these injured soldiers are fit to rejoin the ranks. For badly wounded soldiers, the desire to feel a blade across the throat may seem preferable to enduring the relentless pain of their injuries. This pragmatic view of the wounded reflected the broader Roman ethos, which prioritized military efficiency and the preservation of manpower. In stark contrast, the fates of the enemy's wounded were far less favorable. Those who survived often faced a grim destiny, frequently resulting in captivity, enslavement, or the mercy of death. The Romans were not particularly concerned with the well-being of their adversaries, viewing them primarily as potential slaves or as casualties of war. Once the battlefield had been stripped bare of treasure, the wounded tended to, and salvaged weapons piled high, the grim duty of cleansing the dead truly began. The Roman military made a conscious effort to recover the bodies of those who died in battle, as respect for the deceased was deeply embedded in their culture. Neglecting the dead would demoralize the living soldiers, fostering a belief that their own bodies would be treated with equal disrespect if they fell in battle. This understanding of morale led to significant efforts in recovering fallen comrades, underscoring the army's commitment to its members. When time allowed, fallen soldiers were given honorable burials, which involved elaborate rituals reflecting Roman beliefs about the afterlife. The first step in these ceremonies involved washing the body, symbolizing purification. It would then be anointed with oils and wrapped in a white shroud, 
emphasizing the Roman emphasis on cleanliness and respect. A funeral procession would be organized, often led by the deceased's family, friends, and fellow soldiers. Participants might wear dark clothing to signify mourning, and if the deceased was of high rank, the procession could be quite elaborate, including musicians and performers. Eulogies were delivered during the ceremony to honor the deceased's life and achievements, emphasizing the virtues of bravery, loyalty, and honor, qualities highly regarded in Roman society. Traditionally, Romans practiced cremation, especially during the early Republic. The body would be placed on a pyre constructed of wood and set ablaze, with the ashes collected and placed in an urn. In some cases, particularly for higher-ranking individuals, burial in a tomb or mausoleum was preferred. The funerals of these officers began with a solemn procession, led by fellow soldiers who carried their bodies on biers draped in rich cloths, often dyed in the deep red or purple associated with Roman power. The entire legion, or at least a significant detachment, would attend the ceremony, marching in silence to demonstrate their respect. Behind the body, military standards and flags were carried, and mourners could include family members, other officers, and even veterans who had once fought alongside the deceased. After cremation, the urn would be placed in a family tomb or niche. For particularly distinguished officers, such as a general or a renowned centurion, additional rites might involve the building of monuments or inscribed stele near the burial site. These markers often bore detailed inscriptions that listed the officers' achievements, battles fought, and ranks held throughout their service. In some instances, busts or statues were erected, cementing the officer's image in the collective memory of the troops and the Roman people. Offerings of food, wine or flowers were sometimes left at the grave to honor the spirit of the deceased, reflecting the belief in the continued existence of the soul after death. Romans did occasionally erect war memorials to honor the fallen, with one of the most notable examples being the Tropaeum Traiani at Adam Clissi in modern-day Romania. This massive monument, built in 109 AD, commemorated Emperor Trajan's victories over the Dacians during the Dacian Wars. The Tropaeum Traiani was a large circular structure adorned with reliefs that depicted scenes from the battles and the soldiers' sacrifices. On the lower parts of the monument, plaques listed the names of some 4,000 Roman soldiers who had died during the campaign. However, in wartime, Logistical constraints often meant that rank-and-file soldiers were buried in mass graves or cremated in large pyres. Soldiers and slaves worked quickly, digging shallow graves or burning bodies in massive pyres to manage the overwhelming task of dealing with the dead. Such expediency was necessary, as the chaos of battle and the urgency of the next campaign often took precedence over elaborate funeral rites. Roman soldiers had a voluntary system allowing them to set aside a portion of their salary for a tombstone in the event of their death. This practice ensured that, even if their remains were not recovered, their comrades stationed at the fort would arrange for a proper burial ceremony and provide a tombstone. Many of these tombstones have withstood the test of time. For instance, a notable tombstone could have belonged to a centurion of Legio Vint Valeria Victrix, a legion known for its service in various campaigns, including operations in Germania and Britain. Following the disaster at the Teutoburg Forest in 9 AD, where the legions 17, Sotmoin, and 99 were destroyed, Tiberius sought to restore order in the region. The Legio Vine Valeria Victrix, an experienced unit, was redeployed to Germania Inferior during this turbulent period. This tombstone in Britain, like many from the era, crafted from durable limestone, showcasing the artistry typical of Roman funerary monuments. Standing approximately 1.8 meters tall and about 0.9 meters wide, it might feature a rectangular shape with a slightly curved top, adorned with intricate carvings and reliefs that reflect the soldier's military service. The front face of the stone bore a well-preserved inscription in Latin, detailing his name, rank, and legion. It read, Marcus Favonius Facilis, a centurion of Legio Vintius Valeria Victrix, who served honorably, rests here. As a member of the Legio Vintiates Valeria Victrix, he would have participated in various campaigns. Notably, the emblem of the 20th Legion was a jumping boar, a symbol whose significance is still debated among historians, distinguishing it from other legions that often featured eagles as their insignia. 
However, the enemy dead were often left for the crows unless the Romans had a practical reason to bury them. In most cases, the Romans prioritized the recovery and burial of their own fallen soldiers, as this was seen as a necessary right to maintain the morale of the living and appease the gods. The enemy, on the other hand, was frequently left to the elements, scavengers, or nature's cycle, unless there were specific circumstances, such as political agreements or the need to avoid disease, that compelled the Romans to offer them burial. And through it all, there was always the watchful eye of the gods. The cleanup after a Roman battle was not merely a practical act, but a deeply spiritual one, centered on paying respect to the fallen and appeasing the gods, particularly Mars, the god of war. Victory was seen as a divine favor, and purifying the battlefield was essential to maintaining the goodwill of the gods. Every task carried out on the battlefield, from the recovery of the dead to the clearing of debris, held deep spiritual meaning. The lustratio, a purification rite, was a pivotal ritual that followed the bloodshed. It involved leading the soldiers in a circular procession while priests invoked the gods to purify the army and the land. The rite was often accompanied by sacrifices, usually of animals such as pigs, sheep, or oxen, whose blood was offered to cleanse away the taint of death. Spoils of war, like captured weapons or armor, were used for tropia, victory monuments constructed on the spot to commemorate the win and give thanks to the gods. Dedicated to the gods, recognizing their role in the Roman victory. Romans believed that those who were not properly buried might become lemures, restless, malevolent spirits who could haunt the living and bring divine wrath upon the community. Soldiers who died in battle were buried with reverence, ensuring their spirits found peace and the army could march forward with the gods continued blessing. Through these rituals, purifications, and the erection of monuments, the Romans reaffirmed their bond with the gods, understanding that without their favor, no victory could be assured. Victory was not merely a product of human skill, but a manifestation of divine approval, a relationship the Romans believed they needed to nurture through constant acts of reverence.